Okay, we'll start in a minute. Please sign into the attendance. It's running now. All right, I think we got just about everyone. All right, uh, good morning, welcome back. Welcome to class six. Um, any questions before we get started? People are still trickling. Treat, please try to be here right at nine, not after nine. Thank you. And also rename yourselves last name, comma, first. Thank you. All right, let's start uh, with a few questions. I know from the minute responses that people are still um, confused about two cases we've studied. Um, the first was Lohmeyer v. Bauer, and the second is Frimberger versus Anzalotti. I know there's still a lot of confusion about those cases. Um, and I'm going to try to do my best to clean up the confusion with two questions, which I'll ask um, back to back. Okay, p people are still coming in late. You need to be here right at nine. You don't have, a, there's no commute, there's no traffic. Just be here at 8.59, please. This is, it's annoying because I have to keep admitting people and it's distracting. All right, so I want to ask you now two questions back to back. Um, I'll put here the link to the class notes. Okay. And we'll start with question number one. Okay, so here's question number one, and I'm going to read it too. A bulk, I'm sorry, A builds a bulkhead on protected land. And, and if you don't remember what a bulkhead is, it's basically this structure that you put onto wetlands to prevent the swampy material from spilling over. Okay? So A builds a bulkhead on protected wetlands on Blackacre. A sells Blackacre to B with a general warranty deed. Three years later, B discovers a violation of state environmental laws. Did A violate the covenant against encumbrances? Yes or no? C is not an option, so I'll put C. That's not the right answer, it's A or B. Okay, got about another 15 seconds. Another five seconds or so. All right. Uh, who am I up to? Who's next? Please raise your hand. Someone's got to be up. Jordan. Okay, perfect. Jordan, so refresh recollection, please. What is the covenant against encumbrances? So the covenant against encumbrances guarantees that there are no encumbrances on the property. What's, what, what's, what's an encumbrance? Just try to define it without using the word. Uh, it's a defect on the title. Okay, good. So we're not talking about a cracked foundation or a leaky roof, right? Okay. So... Tell us again, what does a covenant anti encumbrances promise? It promises that basically the title is marketable. That's wrong. Okay. No, okay. that's not right. You're, you're conflating two concepts. What, what does marketability of title mean? I thought marketability of title meant there was no defect on the title. There's no legal defect. But what is the risk of getting an unmarkable title? What's the risk of buying a house with an unmarkable title? Is it then that you don't have all of the property rights to it? No, no, that's not right. Megan, you here? Yes, I'm here. Let's start again. What what's a what's the Covenant against encumbrances. So the covenant against encumbrances is that there are no 
encumbrances. Basically, uh, it's saying that there are no encumbrances such as like mortgages, items, or easements, or covenants that are on the property on the. Uh, okay, good. What's marketability of title? That means that. I, I guess at it. Um, Stop be guessing. It's, there's no reasonable doubt that um, it's valid. What, what, what's what it's valid? I don't know what that means. That the person, the grantor, owned it originally, and everything. no, I, 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 this is really bad. I'm going to try one more time, Cameron. Or I'm sorry, Nicole, um, no, next, I'm sorry, John. What is marketability of title? What, what how have we define that concept in the cases? Um, marketability of title is when there is no potential for loss or injury and there's no ability for litigation to happen. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Right. We have these two concepts. Thank you, John. We have marketability of title, right? That's a concept that usually matters when you're considering whether to buy a piece of property, right? Marketability of title, right? Are you walking to some risk of litigation, you know, for example, um, uh, are you in violation of a zoning ordinance? Are you in violation of a covenant, right? Does a covenant even exist on this property, right? Does a zoning ordinance even exist on this property that you're in violation of? The covenant against encumbrances is different. This arises later after the transaction's already closed, right? And with a covenant against encumbrances, you're not trying to rescind the contract of sale, right? What you're trying to do is seek damages against the seller because of certain defects that were discovered, right? The market of title and the covenants and encumbrances are closely related but they occur at two separate stages. And I'm trying to get this through and I'm not, I think I, I failed. Now three classes we've been on this topic. It's, I'm actually disappointed. Um, three classes we've been on this, All right? So let's go to our question today. Uh, the poll question I asked a minute ago. Hypothetical I gave. All right, people are still trickling in. You have to be here on time. Um, and uh, this is it's frustrating because I have to keep hitting admit, 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 because I can't let people in automatically. All right, so the answer here, did A violate the covenants encumbrances, right? The answer here is no. About 60% of you got this right, which is not a terribly high number. I like it closer to 80, 75, 80. Um, about 40% of you got this question wrong. This is, question number one is the precise holding of Frimberger. It's the exact holding that we had in that case, right? It's the precise holding in that case. That when you have a violation of, uh, I'm sorry, a violation of state environmental law, it does not violate the covenants and encumbrances. This was not a hard question. It was a straight up, so I'm guessing most of you guessed, just didn't know, right? This was the exact question presented in Frimberger. Um, uh, this is this is it, it's worrying it's worrying some because I'm not coming back to this topic after today I've given three classes on it uh, and if you, if it's still not clicking then it's I don't think it's my fault at that point um, try question number two and this question number two I think will illustrate how you understand the relationship between Frimberger and Lohmeyer the question is this a builds a bulkhead on protected wetlands on Black Acre. A sells Black Acre to B with the general warranty deed. Before the transaction closes, B discovers that the bulkhead violates state environmental laws. Can B rescind the contract of sale? Another five seconds or so. All right. 
Uh, I think up to Nicole. Are you here, Nicole? Nicole? No. Uh, Cam, are you here? I'm here. All right, Cam. So what's your answer here? Uh, I put yes. Uh, I don't exactly know what the general warranty deed had to do there because it's still in the process of being sold and the general warranty is for in the future if a defect is found then. Okay. If it's found during the sale. All right. Uh, that would be rescinded. Very good. Now, I want to ask you the follow-up question. Why could you rescind this contract? What about this transaction is problematic that allows you to rescind? What's what what what's 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 failing here? What's lacking here? Um, uh, it's a, a unmarkable title. Yes, it has, it's has a defect on it. Good, good, and just you, you're you're right there. Tell me why is this unmarketable? Um, because there's a violation of a uh, of a zoning ordinance or a covenant, one of the two, and it makes it unmarketable automatically. Okay, very good. Now it's being violated. Okay, good. Now just one last point. What case are you relying on to get there? What, what what's what's the leading precedent for this question? Um uh, the lo it's well, yeah. it's still low wire because it's yeah. still it's during the sale. That's right. Okay. Good, good. All right. Okay. Now um I think uh uh Chase, you here, Chase? Yes. So Chase, I want to ask you a follow-up question. I think Cam gave me the answer in light of um, Lohmeyer. How would this case come out if you were in Connecticut and you were under the Fremberger rule? I think under Fremberger it would be no. Tell me why. Oh, I think you muted yourself, Chase. I'm sorry. I, th I, th I thought you were muttering, but then I said the, the mute thing was on. But wh wh why, why, I'm sorry, just start again. Under Fremberger, why do you think the answer is no? Because it would just be a latent defect. And not what do you mean a latent defect? Something that's... Um, but not enough to overturn the deed. That's not what a latent defect is at all. But why do you, why is a latent defect relevant here? I'm asking how would this case come out in in Connecticut? You're on mute again. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Elias, you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. How would this case, this question number two, come out in Connecticut if you're under the rule in Frimberger? Um, I think it would, it would be no. Okay. Why? And I think it's because the uh, it hasn't become real yet. There hasn't been like an action brought against it, and the uh, the claim. What What allows you to rescind a sale? What What criteria? I think Cam said it a minute ago. Um. You can rescind the sale if, uh, if the property is not marketable. Well, no, you're, you're close. It's not that the property is not marketable. What's not marketable? Just just be precise here. Title. Okay, good. So, Lohmeyer held that you can rescind a contract if the title is, mar is unmarketable, right? Yes, sir. So, Elias, in this question under Connecticut law, under Fremberger, would the title be marketable? Uh, yes. Why? Because the uh, the uh, defect is not is not uh, you know it's not readily observable by a survey or a title abstract. And just be precise. What is the defect here? Just be precise here. This I think Chase was getting at this before, but just what's the defect here? Uh, the defect is physical. It's 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 that 
they built the bulkhead and it's in violation of the state law. Okay, well, you said two different things. One, that they built the bulkhead, and two, there's a violation of the law. Which is the actual defect? You said two different things. Violation. That's it. Okay, good. All right, thank, thank you, Elias. All right, let me, let me just clarify this point. I give this question the precise wording uh, quite deliberately, right? The defect is not the fact that there's a bulkhead in the soil. The defect is the fact that the bulkhead violates the law. And this is what you call a latent defect. It's not obvious that the law is being violated. You can't find this on a survey. In Lohmeyer, these facts would be enough to render the title marketable. And with an unmarkable title, you can rescind the contract of sale. In Connecticut, in the Frimberger rule, the court says the opposite. The court says that a latent violation of an environmental law would not render the title marketable. And in Connecticut, you could not rescind this contract of sale. Now, um, how do you reconcile the Lohmeyer case with Frimberger? Um, I think in, I think an easy way to do it, though I don't know if it's perfect, is that the I think the Lohmeyer rule is probably majority. Um, I think the Frimberger rule is probably minority. Uh, I you know I checked the the teacher's manual. I looked around a bit. I think this aspect, the marketability of titles, probably not the majority rule. I'm not sure if it's even correct, but um, I want you to understand those two standards because the Frimberger case basically said. The violation of zoning law is not a, a violation of the covenant against encumbrances, and the violation is not does not render the title marketable. So, in other words, even if um, the buyer had discovered this violation at the executory stage early on, I don't think he could have rescinded the contract of sale, which is a very strange holding. I think it's probably wrong, but I want you at least understand that. Okay, questions on that case? All right, so the answer is A. This one, I think everyone got, got um, 90% of you got this one correct, which is good. I don't know that you'll know, I don't know if you'll know why you got it, but I think at this point, it should be clear how Lohmeyer would lead to A and how Frimberger leads to B. All right, and, and, and by the way, Cam was right. The, the bit about the general warranty deed was a red herring. It was not... It was not needed for the question, uh, but I, I put it in there just to see if people were paying attention. Yes, uh, Diana, go ahead. Um, just to repeat the last thing you said, you said under Connecticut and Frimberger, um, the latent violation of environmental law would not render the title of marketable, unmarketable, even though it would have been found before the contract closed. Right? I think that's, that's, that's the way I read Frimberger, and I think that's probably wrong, but I think that's what the court was suggesting. It does say it, at one point it will not violate the covenant encumbrances, and the defect would not render it unmarketable. I think it's probably wrong holding, but that's what, the, that's what the case held. Thank you. Make sense? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I encourage you to, to go back after class and review both question one and question two. Uh, question two, you got mostly right, 90% of you, but question one was closer to 60%, uh, which is a little bit low uh, for my... The reason why this polling is helpful and both also why it overreacts so much is it tells me instantly how the class is doing. Um, uh, you know, in the past, I would just assume people understood what I'm saying. Uh, now I have numbers saying that it's not clicking, which is both... Um, uh, rewarding that I get this instant feedback, but also um, concerning when, uh oh, people aren't getting it. So that's why I'm doing some of these damn questions. I know it takes up a lot of time uh, and it detracts from other class time, but I think it's it's far more valuable to get a pulse of where you are, uh, where you all are, uh, and this is very helpful. All right, let's try another question. This is question number three. Okay, so. The question says, O sold Blackacre to A with a general, I'm sorry, a special warranty deed during the prior decade. B acquired Blackacre through adverse possession. Uh oh. Is O liable to A in the special warranties? Okay, so someone put C. That's not, there's no, who, I, I don't, it's a very technical reason why people keep putting C. Okay, it's gone. Uh, maybe they're just messing with me. I don't know. All right, another 20 seconds.
Mm. And I think uh, we'll be going to Corey in about five seconds. All right, Corey, you here? No, no, Corey. Okay, who's number one? Backups up. I think Troy. I think you're 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 the first alphabetically. Yeah, that's me. Sorry, I put C because I thought we were on question four for a second. <laughs> okay, well that that's that, that's an explanation. Okay, well let's can we do question three for a minute? Yes. Okay, so let me ask you a question first, uh, if I can, Troy. Um, what is a special warranty deed? A uh, special warranty deed is a one is a warranty for only for defects that arise during the grantor's ownership. Uh huh. And it's also secures you against the sorry yeah stop that against the during the grantor's ownership. Okay, so Troy, let me ask you a question. What happened during the grantor's ownership? So during the grantor's ownership, it looked like. He acquired Black Over Black Acre through um, adverse possession. All right, and just just re refresh your recollection. How would be going about acquiring Black Acre by adverse possession? Um, what do you have to do? What's, what's to happen? You have to be present on the land for um, ten for the statutory amount of time, mm -hmm. and then all a quiet claim. Okay. Now. Uh, in order for B to acquire Black Acre over the past decade, what must O not do? Um, o must not be also present on the land and also must not dispute. Um, what do you mean not dispute? Generally, so not, if, if O sees that, that B is squatting, what's O yeah. usually going to do? Kick him off. He's going to eject him, right? Did that happen here? Uh, it appears not. It appears not. Huh. Okay. So then O then goes ahead and gives a general warranty, a special, a special warranty deed. Yeah. At that point, Troy, did O actually own Blackacre? Um, no. No. Is that a problem? Can you sell a piece of land you don't own? You cannot. Well, you can, but it's a, but it's a fraud, right? You, by the way, uh, thank, thanks, Troy. In this class, I promise you, on the exam, people will sell land they don't own. I promise you, 100%. The mere fact that O is selling Blackacre to A does not mean that O actually owns Blackacre. I never said that in the question, just that the words aren't there. All right, uh, Anthony, you here? Yep, you hear t t Anthony? Yeah. Okay, Anthony, yeah. Let, me, let me ask the question then. When O sold Blackacre to A, did O own Blackacre? No. No, he didn't. Is that a problem? Yeah. Okay, well, t tell me why is it a problem? Uh, because he, in his mind, I guess he thought he owned it, so he was selling it to him. However, under the special warranty deed, he wouldn't be able to do that because it would technically belong with whoever it was that had personally. What, what 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 exactly in the special in the special warranty deed is is covered? Just the grantor, not anyone else. Ah, and was the grantor at fault here? Was was O at fault? He was. Why was O at fault? Because he let the individual adversely possess the property. Ah, so is O liable to A in the special warranties? Yes. Yeah. Oh boy. This one was not good, guys. 70%. Ooh, sorry. 70% of you put B. Uh, the answer is A. Right? Now, the reason why I framed the question this way is it combined two things we've studied. Right? It combined adverse possession. And it can combine the concept of special warranty deeds, right? What you have to remember with adverse possession is it was O's fault that B was able to uh, squat for a decade, right? And with the covenant, I'm sorry, with, with, with the special warranty deed, you're still promising that you have 
uh, the ability to convey a fee simple, basically, that, that, that you actually own the property, the covenant season, you might want to call it, the most basic covenant you have, right? So when you're, when you're transferring land that there was a squatter on, that is a defect, right? That would violate the covenant. Yes, Farn? I was just wondering, I know you said quick claim deeds arise, you know, when you buy property at auctions, but what situations do special warranty deeds come from? Uh, you, you can sell them in any transaction, right? The general warranty deed um, provides protection for the acts of the grantor, but also the acts of the grantor's predecessors, right? The special warranty deed only protects the acts of the grantor. Why would you want one versus the other? The general warranty deed is more expensive, and the special warranty deed is cheaper. And the quick claim deed is cheapest of all three. So it's really a question of price, right? How much risk are you willing to take? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Um, you know, maybe a person gives a special warranty deed because they don't really know about their predecessor and they're really not sure how they got it. So they're only guaranteeing their own actions. Does that make sense? Sense? All right. So not so good with the quizzes today. Um, that one was, uh, you know, I think I, I think I think people said, oh, well, it wasn't, you know, he's only he's only guaranteeing his own acts. And, you know, um, you know, it was, you know, it's not his fault, but but it is right. If, if you lose Blackacre to B through adverse possession, it's 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 you fail to, you know, actually take action to to remove the squatter. All right. Let's try one more question. Question number four. All right. Question number four gives you a chain of title. Oops. Um, we'll be doing more of these sort of chains of title, I think, next week. Um, uh, but let, let's, let's walk through this, right? In 2000, B purchased Blackacre from A and receives a general warranty deed. In 2005, C purchased Blackacre from B and receives a quick claim deed. In 2010, D purchased Blackacre from C and receives a general warranty deed. In 2015, E reveals that he purchased Blackacre from A in 1995. Uh-oh, we have a problem, right? E shows up and claims a, a purchase from, from 20 years earlier. E sues D to quiet title on Blackacre. Right? D was the most recent owner. So now the question is, who can D sue for the breach of the covenant of a quiet enjoyment? A, B, C, D, E. Oh, A, B, C, all the above or none of the above. Okay, give you another 15 or 20 seconds. Okay. All right, and Haley, I'll call you about 10 seconds. All right, Haley, what is your answer here? I put C. Okay, tell me why. Um, because C received it in the quick claim deed, which kind of cuts off the liability of the others. Okay, that's exactly right. The key point here is that you can always go up the chain so long as there are general warranty deeds. But as soon as there's a quick claim deed in the chain, it cuts it off. So because B gave C a quick claim deed, B is off the hook. And because B is off the hook, then A is off the hook. So the only person that C can, can bring to the lawsuit, if you want to think of it in Civ Pro language, implead, remember that concept, the impleader? It's somewhat similar. Um, the only person that C can sue for his damages is D, right? Because they're thinking is D failed to, I'm sorry, C can, D can sue, I said it backwards. C can be sued by D, right? D can sue C because C failed to uh, uh, insure against this claim by A from many years earlier. So the answer here is C. Now that one was about 70% of you got this right, which is better. Uh, but the answers were spread. Ch uh, Chance, was your hand up? I think your hand just went down, actually. Uh, 
I mean, it was just kind of on the previous question. We assumed fraud, uh, or we did, we we didn't, we assumed that because we didn't have language saying that A owned it, we assumed that that, that he didn't. That that was part of it. Um, would there be any type of okay? Well, we need to assume A might not have owned it in this question as well, or anything like that, or um, essay standpoint. Oh, are you saying it's not clear? Are you talking about question three now? So in question three, we have we don't have any guarantee that uh, O necessarily owned it at some point in time. We used to say, okay, like in that decade, you know, B, 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 got, B got it in that decade. Uh, is, 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 that, is that why you got the question wrong? Is that what you're thinking? That was kind of, that, that's what really threw me off was whether or not like, the timing aspect of it. And I was looking at, the, at question four, I was like, okay, well, you know, B purchased it from A. Well, did, did A really own it at that time? We don't know for a fact A owned it. You know, uh, could A have sold a general warranty deed uh, in two thousand? I see. I see your point. Okay. That so, so, so you, so you weren't sure if O was at fault for B's adverse possession. Is that what you're saying? That was part of it. Yeah, that was, that, that was part of the thing that threw me off. But so, if I had said B acquired Black Eagle from O through adverse possession. Like this. That would have definitely clarified a, a, a mm -hmm. quite a bit on that question. I would have, I would have felt a lot more confident about my answer. Okay. All right. I can I can take that I can take that friendly amendment. All right. Fair point. But it, it, it's, but it's the same thing with four. I mean, in general, like we can assume. So, so, I don't know. Uh, I need I need to phrase that question better. I'll give it the answer. Five. Sorry about that. That's fine. All right, Mackenzie, you wanted a, a question. Uh, yes. Um, if it had been a special warranty deed instead of a quick claim deed, would um, would that cut off the chain from everybody else above, or would that just cut off the um, liability of that one grantor who gave it in special? Yeah, that deed? that's that's a good question. Um, let me think about that for a second. So you're saying B gave C a special warranty deed? Yes. Uh, I think it would have the same effect because the 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 the, the claim of A arose in 1995, and I think at that point um, A was on Blackacre. So I think if if the 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 2005 deed was special warranty, I think the answer would still be the same. I think it'll still cut off the chain. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Troy, go ahead. A. Quick claim doesn't give the um, if, if there's fraud, you can still um, I'm sorry, if there's fraud, you can still sue for that, correct? Even if it is a quick claim. I'm sorry, just who's suing who for fraud? Just just I want to be precise here. So I'm assuming if whenever you get into um to adding on people to the lawsuit, since the quick claim breaks that chain, right? But then it, um, C wanted to sue. B. Right. You're saying no ability to see to B at all, even though that, that would be potentially fraud, even though that B didn't. Well, it. keep something in mind, um, uh, Troy, it's a statute of limitations, right? Yeah. Generally, the statute of limitation runs within a certain number of years after, uh, you know, after the transaction occurs, right? So this transaction occurred between C and B in 2005. We're now in 2015. In all likelihood, the statute of limitations already expired. The reason why you can sue for the covenant of quiet enjoyment is it's an ongoing covenant, it's a future covenant, in which the statute of limitation starts running when the defect is discovered, when the problem is discovered. So in these sorts of cases, it's unlikely that you can bring a fraud action because the statute's already run. You have to rely on the covenant in the, the future co the future covenants in, in your deed. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Right, it's actually a really good question. I'm glad I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, Troy just asked it. One of the most important things about this class is I'm not teaching you fraud. This is not a contracts class. Um, if for whatever reason on the exam you think the answer is fraud, you're wrong. I'm not, that's, I'm not asking about fraud. I'm not going to ask about fraud. I don't care what the elements of fraud are. It's just not, that's for another class. It's not for me. Um, what I want to know is are the covenants in the uh, deed violated? Are the present covenants violated when the contract's sold? 
I'm sorry, when the contract's executed, or are there future covenants violated at some point down the road? And this covenant of quiet enjoyment is a future covenant that people will not disturb you with a superior claim. Make sense? All right, Nick, go ahead. Um, I just had a question. So when E sues D to quiet title, okay. um, could D claim adverse possession as their defense? Yeah, they probably will. Okay. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's a very common way I can test this. Adverse possession is often going to be tested alongside these chain of title questions. Because when you have four or five people live in Blackacre for you know for 20 years, and then A shows up, it's like, hey, that's that's mine, right? They're gonna raise a defense of adverse possession and they'll claim tacking and they'll claim privity to, to put their time together because no one by themselves is there for 10 years, they're there for five year periods. This is like the case from the, the Hood uh, Canal, and there were Howard versus Kunto, where he had different people living on the same plot for, for many, many years. But exactly right. This it's a if you notice, I asked adverse possession here. And it's adverse possession in the previous question. It's a very good way for me to test on two different concepts in one question. All right, thanks, Nick. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, 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 chances friendly amendment. It, it, it wasn't entirely clear from the way I wrote the question initially that A had acquired it. I'm sorry, that B had acquired it from O through adverse possession. I thought it was clear, but I'll take the friendly amendment. Uh, if you got it wrong for that reason, Good for you. It was a very technical nuance, uh, but hopefully that's why the numbers are so disparate. So I'll, I'll withdraw my criticism. I, I see that I didn't put the question as clearly as I could have. And I, I try, uh, but uh, invariably I miss stuff. Um, this is why I don't ask multiple choice questions in the exam, uh, because no matter how hard I think about the questions, there's always something that I don't see the student will. And once you give a multiple choice question, there's only a right answer. There's an A, B, C, or D. There's no like A, a you know, A slash B. Um, on an essay, very often, as you probably know, I'll give a question and then I won't anticipate a certain response. And then if I see that a lot of people put in like, wait a minute, they have a good point. And I can go back and adjust the points. And I do that every year. Like I'll grade a couple of papers like, wow, that's that's new. I didn't think of that. And then I see it again. Oh, yeah. And then, then you know, I can always I can always adjust. And that's how I think it's fair to grade. I don't I don't like multiple choice. Okie doke. All right, let's move on. Okay, let's do the first case, um, which is Rosengrant versus Rosengrant. And, and just a rule of thumb, you maybe already know this, whenever you see the same last name twice, like Jones versus Jones or Smith v. Smith, it's a family dispute. It might be a divorce case, it might be a custody case, it might be an inheritance case, but these are family squabbles. And it's, I guess it's sad, I don't know, I, perhaps unavoidable that uh, families have these sorts of disputes. But that, that's sort of the way, uh, sort of the way the world works. Uh, Dylan, are you here? Present. Okay, Dylan, you wanna give me the facts, please, in, um, Rosengrant P. Rosengrant. So pretty much Jay was one of what six nieces and nephews of Good. the of his aunt and uncle Mildred and Harold. But he him and his wife took care of them. And after he his wife got cancer, Harold um kind of like conveyed Jay a present the well, uh, the, uh, you, you, you say kind of. There's a lot of a lot of stuff going with that kind of. Just let, let's walk through the nature of this. It's a very bizarre transaction. You've probably never seen anything like this before. Can you please walk me through this transaction, uh, Dylan? So they got an attorney, and then they presented Harold and, Harold and Mildred with the deed to their home. What, 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 was it an attorney? Yeah. Hold, hold, hold on. Who was this guy? Was he a lawyer? Um. I thought he was. No. Where were they meeting? They met at the bank, so it seems maybe he was just a banker. Okay, that's better. Banker, go on. And then they asked about the legality of it, and pretty much they they both signed the deed, and they gave it to him, and 
and he gave him that to make the look good. All right, all right, all right. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you, uh, Marissa. You here? Yes, I'm here. All right, so Marissa, let me ask you a question, please. Why do you think Harold and Mildred, this elderly couple, did this sort of elaborate routine at the bank where they signed a deed, they handed it to Jay, and then Jay gave it back to the banker? Right? Why did they do this elaborate you know, procedure? What were they trying to do here? Um, I think they were doing it to basically cover all their bases and make sure that what they were doing was valid. Pretty. What could they have just done? What would have been a hell of a lot easier than this entire elaborate ritual? I think they could have just handed it to him. And let him do what with it? Record it. Yeah, keep it. Record it. Now, now, Marissa, the follow-up question is, why didn't they take the most simple path, right? Why didn't they just give him the deed and let him record it right away? Uh, because... Their like condition on it was basically that we have to die first before you get the right. You, 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 that's correct, but I'm asking why did this elderly couple not just hand over the deed to their farm? Because they were still using it. Yeah, yeah. And what were they afraid of happening if they handed over the deed to the farm? Him basically taking full possession and them not not be able to use it as yeah, they... yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Thanks, Marissa. Look, Harold and Mildred were not stupid right? They understood what was going on. They were old. They needed someone to take care of them. They didn't probably didn't have much money. So they said, I got an idea. Let's promise that when we die, Black Acre, the farm, goes to Jay. So they couldn't give Black Acre to the, um, to the son, I'm sorry, not the son, to the, to the nephew right away. They said, ah, we'll give it to him after we die, right? Uh, Cassie, do you hear? I'm here. Cassidy, generally, if you want to give something to a person after you die, what's the way you go about doing it? What do we usually call that? You give them the remainder? That's such a good answer. Not what I'm looking for. It's a good answer, right? Now, <laughs> right. So what happens if, let's just say, Cassidy, you own Blackacre... And you want to give your, you know, your your nephew a black acre after you die. What 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 does that transaction look like? How, how would we describe that? You, you just write out a will. Mm, I'm asking. You said before remainder. How would you give someone a remainder? Uh, you would you have to convey the future interest. Okay, and what's the present interest? I'm sorry. What's the present interest that connects with the remainder? I feel like I'm on thin ice here. All right. The present interest. Can you repeat the question? What is the present interest? If the future interest is a remainder, what's the present interest? Um, you need to remember this from last semester. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's in there. It's underneath stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Are you telling me shh? I just have an assist. Just an assist. Um, present interest. Well, let's see if you can figure this out. At what point yeah. does remainder kick in? What has to happen for remainder to kick in? Um, there has to be a, a contingency or someone has to die. Um, right, right. Okay, that, that second part's right. Someone has to die. What do you call an estate that ends in someone's death? Um... Testamentary estate? No. 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 Life estate. <laughs> I know it. I know you get the second I said it. Unfortunately, my friends, you have to remember last semester. I was taking a job this morning. I was thinking about life estates and it's all. I forgot. Okay, all right. Oh, that, that, that's fine. Right. You need to remember this from last semester, life estate. But the Cassidy, her first answer, I think, was correct. If. Yeah, if the farm, if if Harold and Mildred wanted to give Jay an interest after they died, they could have given him a remainder, and they could have reserved for himself a life estate. They could have done that. 
Okay. Uh, Heather, are you here? Yep. So Heather, let me ask you a question. If Harold and Mildred gave a remainder to Jay, was that fixed? Was that permanent? Could you revoke a remainder? Well, uh, Cassidy described the remainder as a future interest, right? What exactly is a future interest? Um, it's just an estate in the property that somebody doesn't have yet. Right. So after what happens? What has to happen for the remainder to kick in? Does everyone die? So is a remainder certain to happen sooner or later? Yes. Okay. So if they'd given a remainder here, no matter what happened when the, 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 the aunt and uncle died, Jay would get it, right? Mm -hmm. But did they give a remainder here, Heather? Yes. Right. What did they give? All right, all right, good. Th thank you, Heather. All right, so what, what I'm trying to get at here is if the aunt and uncle really wanted to give Blackacre to Jay after they died, they'll give him a remainder. Now, they didn't do that. We don't know why. Uh, maybe they weren't sophisticated. They didn't really know the details. Maybe they weren't so sure about Jay, right? Maybe they wanted to have the ability to perhaps um, take it back. Maybe they wanted to give it to another niece or nephew. Or maybe, and this is my cynical approach, they didn't really want Jay to have it by himself. They had six nieces and nephews, and maybe they wanted to share it with all of them. So it isn't entirely clear what was going on here. Cassidy, go ahead. I mean, that was kind of my question. And I'm like, why did they even bother having this whole, like, you know, dog and pony show? I think they played him. I think they. I think they played him. You keep coming over and doing work for him and, and stuff. Look, I, I, I think I think Jay might have gotten played. I think the aunt and uncle had this elaborate thing to help make him think one thing when that wasn't really what was going on. I think they, the aunt and uncle, wanted him to think it was his, so they would help him around the farm and take care of his wife and stuff, and then they played him. Because, look, they talked to a lawyer, right? They could have done stuff to make this legit, and they never did it. So, you know, I, who, who knows? You know, Harold and Mildred may, may have been, you know, just not very sophisticated. My intuition is I, I think they probably played them. Uh, they also tried to avoid the probate process, right? Because if you sign a will, you need to have two witnesses as a public document very often. And they perhaps didn't want their... Nieces and nephews knowing they got cut out of the cut out of the estate. You know, a lot of people avoid making a will um, to avoid family conflicts, right? Right. They they don't sign a will because it's it's a lot of hard work. You have to say, oh, I love this family member. I don't love him, etc. Um, even really wealthy people often die without wills. Uh, one of the most famous examples recently was Aretha Franklin. You may have seen this in the news the last couple of years. She was a legend, right? A legend. of, of, of uh, And she, she basically had no will. There was some handwritten document she had, but it wasn't even clear if it was a valid will. I think Prince also uh, did not have a will. Um, uh, not, not Prince William, but, but the artist really known as a uh, uh, Prince, right? I think Prince William... Uh, I, th I think the artist known as Prince did not have a will. So a lot of people just don't have wills. Um, I think the, the couple may have wanted to avoid that process. All right. 
So again, we have this elaborate transaction where, you know, the they, they, the aunt and uncle give a deed to the neat nephew, then the nephew hands it back to the banker. Uh, Allison, you here? Allison? Catherine? No, Catherine. Dana? Thank you. Okay, good. I know I saw you earlier. So, Dana, after they did this entire ritual with the aunt, with, with, with the deed, the banker put the banker put the 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 deed inside of an envelope. What did the banker write on the envelope? He wrote both Harold and Jay's name on it. He wrote Harold and Jay's name on it. What was the significance of writing both of those names on the envelope? Um, the, I think the case said that Harold continued to have a form um, and use some control and he could take it back whenever he wanted because it was still on the ah, That Harold could take it back whenever he wanted. Why is that fact uh, significant, Anna? Because it means that he never really um, conveyed the use and control to Jay. He kept it to himself. Ah. So no title was conveyed. Or What's the magic word? The, the deed was not blank. Um, What's the magic word? I remember, um, it was an after uh, delivered. Delivered. Very good. Right. That's the theme of the case. There was no delivery. Or let me be more precise. There was a delivery, but there was not a delivery for present interest. Right? If there was a present interest that was delivered, there would be a present interest conveyed right away. But there was no present interest delivery. At the most, there was a future interest being delivered. Right? At the most, there was a future interest being delivered. That would kick in after death. Now, you can do that. You can say, after I die, you will get an interest in Black Acre. During my life, you get nothing. But after I die, you get an interest in Black Acre. That's perfectly valid. You're allowed to do that. That is not a remainder. Right? And I want to go back to Cassidy's point a few minutes ago. What I just described is not a remainder. With the remainder, you're giving the future interest now. And it's set. You cannot revoke it. There was a case last semester about a painting, right? Remember where a father gave the son a, uh, an interest in his painting? When you give a future interest, it's valid in the present. I know it's almost like an oxymoron. How can you have a present future interest? It's a future interest that you have now. A remainder is vested. If I can use that phrase. A vested remainder. It's certain to vest. But when you give a testamentary gift, as they're called, right, it's a gift that can be revoked. I can write up a will today and leave everything to you and then rip it up tomorrow and give it to someone else. And the third day, rip it up and not have a will at all. With testamentary gifts, there's nothing conveyed in the present. It's only conveyed in the future. Now, again, you can have a testamentary gift. There's no problem with it. But to give a testamentary gift, you have to comply with the statute of wills. The statute of wills. Um, generally, the statute of wills requires witnesses, right? Two independent people have to certify that this document was signed. There was no duress. There was no fraud. Everyone was, you know, on honest terms. Why are there such strict requirements for a statute of wills? The answer is that there's no one there to tell you about it, right? Dead men tell no tales, as the saying goes. Um, after Harold and Mildred are dead, they can't come back and, you know, say, oh, no, that's not what I intended. That's not what I intended, right? The two witnesses are there to make sure that there's someone who can at least speak to the circumstances of the gift after the, we're called the testators. The testators are, are, are long gone. So the testamentary gift, you need to comply with the statute of wills. 
this deed did not comply with the statute of wills. It did not. All right. So the holding here is that the gift here was testamentary in nature. Right? It was a future interest. But there was no proper delivery. Because there was not meant to be a present interest delivered at all. Okay. Yes, Mackenzie, go ahead. I just kind of have a random question. That's but fine. Um, so when you sign the will, you know, you have two witnesses. What happens if those two witnesses die before the person yeah. whose will it is, and then later on, you know, the family wants to contest the will? Someone always asks this question. Yeah, I mean, look, it's possible the witnesses are, are old and are, are old, decrepit. Um, generally, the witnesses are like secretaries at the law firm. That's generally the witnesses are uh, in, in, in most cases. But um, I, had, I had to witness some wills this summer. <laughs> oh, well, you're, you're, you're young and, you know, uh, healthy. Hopefully you'll be around uh, uh, long enough. Um, I think the short answer is even if both witnesses are dead, you still have a writing and you can at least rely on the writing. The witnesses... The witnesses aren't there to necessarily testify in the future. It's sort of to keep everyone honest. In other words, if you know people are watching over your shoulder, you're less likely to have a, a crooked arrangement, right? You're more likely to try and make it above board. So it's almost like a like a precautionary me measure, right? It's not that the witnesses will necessarily have to be involved in probate. I think it keeps everyone honest. Yeah, I think they told me that it's like... Um if a family member was to first say that they were incompetent to... Yeah, yeah, capacity, yeah. yeah. Did you actually read the documents? Um, some of them. I had to draft some, too. Oh, so. were you working at a law firm? I did this summer. I oh. interned. Oh, good. So this, this this probably makes sense to you. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. All right. Does everyone get the majority opinion, right? There was no delivery. This was a testamentary gift, and it failed to comply with the statute of frauds. Therefore, they're, 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 it's as if the, um, the, the deed, they never even had the situation in the bank, as if it never even happened. Right? This was all for nothing. And poor Jay does not have any claim to the Black Acre. Instead, he has to probably split it with the six other nephews and nieces, or five other ones. All right, any questions in the majority? I'll mention the, um, the, the concurrence briefly. Um, the concurring justice, Justice Breitmeyer, doesn't believe Jay. Uh, he thinks Jay is lying. He thinks Jay made up this entire um, account, and we can't really double check because everyone's dead. The banker's dead. Uh, Harold's dead. Mildred's dead. They're all dead. This is the question based Mackenzie asked a minute ago. They're all dead, and there's no writing to confirm this ever happened. Um, so basically, the concurrence doesn't believe Jay. I don't know if I do either. Nancy, go ahead. No, 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 no. Statute of wills. The statute of frauds is the general rule that applies to all conveyances, right? If I give you, remember the first intervivos? Remember that phrase, intervivos? Intervivos means during life. If I give you a conveyance intervivos, it has to comply with the statute of frauds. There has to be a writing. Okay, you don't need witnesses, just need to have a writing. The statute of wills is more strict. The statute of wills requires the witnesses, which is actually a huge formality you have to comply with. So, right, all inter vivos conveyances comply with the statute of frauds. And then on top of that, if it's testamentary, you need the statute of wills. So there's two statutes to think about. Uh, and I encourage you to read the case summary for this case. I walk through those facts in the case summary. Okay, good, Nancy? Thanks. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the next case? I guess the last case. Okay, I see SpongeBob in the background. <laughs> yes, I see nods. Okay. Uh, all right. So the next case involves mortgages. Um, well, let's get some terminology straight. This question should be very quick. 
30 seconds for this one. Who or what is the mortgagor? The buyer, the seller, the bank, or none of the above? Who or what is the mortgagor? The buyer, the seller, the bank, or none of the above? Okay, another 10 seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Stop it there. All right, now do question number six. I'm doing these in succession for a reason. Who or what is the mortgagee? Who or what is the mortgagee? The buyer, the seller, the bank, or none of the above? Another 10 seconds. Okay. Now question number seven, I promise. There's a reason I'm asking these back to back to look on over them. Question number seven. What does the mortgagor give the mortgagee? A, a note or B, a mortgage? Good, another 10 seconds. Okay, stopping it here. Last one, question number eight. I promise, there's a reason why I'm doing these. What does the mortgagee give the mortgagor? All right, 10 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna stop it here. All right, so let me explain some basic terminology. And this is something that students always mess up on. Um, in class, I've explained before that when you're looking at these terms, mortgagor, mortgagee, grantor, grantee, we look at who's giving and who's receiving, right? The grantor is giving the grant of property. The grantee is accepting the grant of property, right? The testator is giving the testamentary gift. The testatee is receiving the testamentary gift. Both mortgages it sort of throws people off for a loop because people often think that the bank is giving the mortgage to the buyer and that's simply not correct. The buyer gives the mortgage to the bank. The buyer gives the mortgage to the bank. What's a mortgage? A mortgage is an interest, a security, a secured interest on Blackacre. What does that mean? Why is the bank giving you this money? The bank is giving you this money because I need it. Well, no, that's not why they're giving it. The bank's giving you the money because they're getting something out of it. They realize that if they give you this money, they'll get it back with interest. They make a profit off of that. But of course, what if you don't pay off the loan? Well, they get to perhaps foreclose on your house. They have to actually have a, an, an auction, a public sale, where they perhaps acquire the house. What allows a bank to foreclose in your house? The mortgage. When the buyer gives a mortgage to the bank, the buyer is giving an interest saying, here bank, I promise to pay you this money back, but if I don't, you can foreclose on the interest, right? The mortgage is an interest. So who's giving the mortgage? The buyer. Who's getting the mortgage? The bank. 
Now, what does the bank give to the buyer? Something called a note, a promissory note, right? You, you probably know the term for your, from your student loans, right? If you ever actually pay off your loan, God willing, you'll, I paid mine off about two years ago, beautiful moment, uh, you actually get the note, which says that, you know, Josh had paid off all this debt. So let's go through these questions, right? Question number eight. What does the mortgagee, actually, no, let's start with question number, um, I think I screwed the numbering. I uh, hope I didn't mess this up. Okay, let's go first to question number five. Who or what is the mortgagor? The mortgagor is the buyer. Because the mortgagor is giving, OR, right? Giving the mortgage. Now, now question number six. Who is the mortgagee? The bank. Because the bank is receiving or accepting the mortgage. But half we got this one wrong. Then question seven. What does the mortgagor give the mortgagee? The buyer gives the bank the mortgage, B. And then what does the mortgagee give the mortgagor? The note. Okay. Go back after class and you go over these four questions to make sure you get your terminology straight. All right. Um, the last class isn't particularly complicated. Um, it's actually, I think, one of the easier cases, but I think a good teaching case. Um, this case illustrates the foreclosure process. Uh, we have a situation here where Murphy had a mortgage with a bank. He lost his job. He fell behind in his payments. Murphy tried to work out a compromise with the um, with the bank, and they actually, I think they work with him a little bit. They said, we'll postpone the sale if you pay all of your back payments. But every time they postponed the sale, they added more fees. And by the time they got to the foreclosure sale, Murphy could not afford to pay all the fees. The sale was held outside of the guy's house. A single bid was made. Who made the bid? The bank. Now, that's actually fairly common. At these foreclosure sales, often the bank is the only party making the bid. And how much did the bank bid? The exact amount that was owed on the mortgage. That was not a coincidence. All they were trying to do was basically wipe out the debt. Even though the house was worth more. Now we have these two duties, duty of good faith and the duty of due diligence. These are very similar to contract doctrine, uh, maybe a little bit different than you studied. The court finds here that the banks engaged in good faith practices, right? That they didn't try to um, cheat them, that they advertised the sale, that they postponed it. They engaged in good faith. But the court finds the bank did not engage in due diligence. Specifically, they didn't use due diligence to find a better price. If there was only one bid present, maybe the bank could have postponed the auction and tried it again. Or if there's only one bid present, maybe they could have set a minimum that they won't sell it for less than a certain amount. This, I think, was a significant holding. In most cases, the courts do not find uh, bad faith or due diligence violations. Um, at that point, what happens, right? Well, they don't cancel the foreclosure sale because someone probably already living on Blackacre. Instead, what the court did was they ordered damages. And they said, okay, the sale brought in $27,000, but the fair price was something greater than $27,000. What is the fair price? The court doesn't really say. Um, the fair price is what maybe a court thinks the house should have gotten on, 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 at a fair auction. Um, the fair price, just to note, is usually less than the fair market value, right? The trial court said that the fair market value is 54,000, but it's not always possible to get the fair market value price. So the fair price, if fair market value is here, fair is somewhere below it, exactly where it's unclear. But here the court found a violation of the duties of due diligence. Okay, and I have the summary of this case in the uh, in the folder. I encourage you all to read it later to get 
the nuances. But again, I'd much rather spend our time in class um, going over these questions. I think they're much more helpful. Okay, I'm going to start the poll for the minute paper, which you can start typing now. Uh, questions before we uh, say goodbye for the day. Uh, before the weekend, we have a long weekend coming up. Yes, Chris, go ahead. So, so I read this one as being basically because they had equity in the house and the bank didn't really pay them for the equity. That's kind of why they they found the way they did. So, is that common today? Would it common be common to expect that at foreclosure would still sell the house and that the owners, if they've got equity in it, should get their equity back? You know, Krista, I don't know that this is a common case. I think in most cases the um, the bank wins. Um, in most cases, the bank will basically wipe out whatever debt there is and not protect the equity. By the way, when you say equity, people may know what the term means. Uh, Murphy had been paying off his mortgage for some time, and there were some amounts that he had paid in that he'll never get back out of the house. So he basically walked through at zero. Um, I'll mention next class uh, when I come back to it. What happens if the, um, it, it'll just say you owe $100,000 in the mortgage and the sale is only for $75,000. In theory, the bank can come after the buyer for what's called deficiency judgment to make up the gap. Those are very unpopular. You just lost your house, you just got foreclosed upon, now you have a big, now you have a big, big bill. Uh, they're not very popular because generally if a person loses their house, they don't have the money to pay the deficiency judgment, but you can still seek it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that one next class when we come back after the break. All right, anything else? All right, uh, please put in your, your, your answers for the uh, last minute poll. Uh, I have my other class in a few minutes, but we'll start office hours around, you know, uh, 12, uh, 30 or so. All right, I'll see you all soon. Thank you.